Dementia Researcher podcast, talking careers, research, conference highlights, and so much more. Hello, and thank you for joining us for day three of the AIC Highlights podcast, sharing a snapshot of some of our best bits from the day's presentations. I'm Adam Smith, and I'm delighted to be hosting this week's shows, and today I'm joined by three new brilliant guests. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Jayashri Dasgupta, Samita Kruwe, and Sarah Gregory. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Enthusiastic and not nervous at all, unlike yesterday's. <laughs> Everybody here is smiling and confident. Um, thank you very much for all finding time to join us. And it's easier for all of us because I know, unlike previous days, you're all watching online at home like I am, aren't you? So we don't have the same issue of rushing back to our hotels to try and connect to Wi-Fi. So thank you again. Let's do some proper introductions, though. Jayashri, why don't you go first? Thanks a lot, Adam. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist and currently I'm an Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health at the Global Brain Health Institute um, at Trinity College Dublin. And I'm also the co-founder and project director of Samvedna Care in India, which is an organisation that provides services for people living with dementia and mental health issues. So that's a bit about me. And of course, you've, this is your third appearance on the podcast now, almost in as many months. You were on the GBHI special, and then you give your highlights from the Satellite Symposium. So th welcome back. Thanks, Kim. Thanks a lot. Uh, Samita, why don't you go next? Hi. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Adam, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So my background is occupational therapist. I'm a senior occupational therapist and senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University. And uh, yeah, I've been working with people with dementia for a long time. I've been OT for the last 27 years now. So yeah, my my background is I'm, I've got my master's degree from University of Bradford and I'm starting my PhD in dementia study. So I'm really enjoying this conference. Thank you. That's really exciting. And doing a PhD, of course, is a massive undertaking. How do you feel about that? Oh, I'm really excited and looking forward to it. Uh, my topic is mainly about uh, identifying gaps in dementia curriculum across higher education institutions in the UK because I believe that I think if we teach our students how to care for people with dementia they will be really excellent practitioners so I'm, I'm taking a step backward and you know creating that workforce who can provide person-centered dementia care couldn't agree more it's it's important and so underlooked as well there are so so few occupational therapy dementia researchers i think you know i, I, I can only think of a, a small number of people in that space compared to other other areas well thank you very much for joining us and sarah but welcome back has it been a year since you were with us last you you always pop up on our aac highlight shows <laughs> Yeah, I come once a year. <laughs> Your annual contribution. Well, give us, introduce yourselves for those that haven't been listening for all of a year, and I'm sure things have moved on. Yep, so I'm now a postdoctoral research fellow rather than a pre-doctoral. Um, so I've handed in my PhD and have my fiver and handed in my corrections. So that's super exciting since last year. Um, so I work in the Edinburgh Dementia Prevention Team at the University of Edinburgh, and so my work focuses on understanding more about modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I'm particularly interested in diet and stress and steroid hormones. Wow, um, congratulations. That, that's, <laughs> you must be so happy. <laughs> yes, so happy. Doing it part time is um, an interesting process. But yeah, it's nice to have actually handed it in now and just get to focus on one job rather than a job and a PhD. I think we could do a podcast all about just just doing that PhD. And I, I'm, I think maybe Samita might want to catch up with you afterwards yeah, for sure. how, you, yes. how you managed to do that. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's brilliant news. OK, anyway, that's enough of that. Let's get on with today's highlights. So actually, before we get into your highlights, I'm going to give you all a chance to talk to your own posters because I think you've all had... Uh, poster presentation this week. So I'm going to come back, I'm going to do this in reverse order. I'm going to go back to Sarah first. Tell us about your presentation. Um, so I have three posters that are online. I was supposed to be there in person, but I had to unfortunately put out the last minute. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm just going to highlight there's two that are about patient and public involvement. Um, and I know that that was a real focus of the podcast talk yesterday. So I'm the student chair in the research participant peer. Um, so we've been really passionate about getting much more kind of participant involvement talked about at AAIC 
Um, so one is talking about kind of involving participants in the results analysis stage and kind of how we've approached that. And then the second is about co-production in our younger adult brain health studies. So we're looking at people aged 18 to 39 and we're right at the start. So it's all about kind of how we're co-producing it. And both of those are co-authored by research partners as well. So yeah, I'll highlight those two. There's another one about diet and brain health that you can find with my surname on the um, uh, online portal. Great. So look at, um, actually for all the posters, anybody who's not aware, if you go to the poster section of the online platform and just type in the surname or Sarah Gregory, all your posters will pop up. The one on, uh, the first one you mentioned there on co-production, second one on co-production is, is interesting because I think there's, there's a lack of understanding about the difference between patient and public involvement and co-production. And, and I don't think that gets talked about enough because so many people say that they do co-production, but actually what they really do is p patient and public involvement. Um, what, what do you see? How do you go about co-production that's different to PPI? I suppose it is more involvement than involvement, if that makes sense. I'm not sure that's the best way to describe it. But trying to kind of, starting even earlier, trying to get our kind of stakeholders involved in as much as possible, um, kind of, so we're writing surveys at the moment and actually getting them to kind of help us work out what the questions might look like, um, involving them on authors on literally all of the outputs we have, so kind of the posters, but also our peer-reviewed manuscripts actually including in that stage. And when we get to the point of applying for grants, bringing in representatives there as well, so more more like a kind of member of the research team um, and obviously reimbursing for time a little bit more at that kind of level where we can as well. So rather than kind of seeking feedback on something you're already doing or getting, getting input to something you've already made, it's involving that from the outset. Well, that's really exciting. Thank you, Sarah. So go go have a look at those. What, what are yours about, Samita? Okay, so mine is about investigating uh, nursing students' knowledge of Alzheimer's disease. And this is the study I did at my last university, University of Bedfordshire. So we collected a lot of data using Alzheimer's disease knowledge scale. So this particular study is already published in nursing older people. So I kind of was going to present this uh, in person, but like Sarah, I couldn't go. <laughs> so I, I presented this virtually. and. Uh, the results are really impressive and I think it was really stimulating for me in terms of, you know, understanding the nursing students knowledge. And I'm like doing the same study now in Czech Republic with University of West Bohemia. So and the plan is to compare those studies and maybe another couple of publications following on that. So uh, I was really happy to have this opportunity at AIC to present that uh, through poster. Yeah. That's great. And so just, so how well informed were the nurses? It's very interesting because I, they were informed more about, you know, how to look after people and in terms of diagnosis management, but they didn't understand the course of the disease. Uh, they really, so it's, it's more about, I think, the traditional nursing, how it is offered. So looking after people, but really not understanding how the disease is progressed. So that they lack knowledge about that particular area. And the cohort that we evaluated, or rather I evaluated, they were third year nursing students with some kind of care experience. So some of them were care assistants, some of them were already kind of, you know, working in care homes. So it was really interesting for me to see that although they had that knowledge, they still di couldn't kind of, you know, explain that through the ADKS. I did a recent study at Oxford Brookes University with our OT students uh, and we didn't use a particular scale but we did qualitative study so I collected data and then we are going to evaluate that so that's the next step looking at the OT students now how much uh, they get uh, you know get to know during their curriculum. I, I suppose the challenge with addressing that question at the student stage is I guess nursing education probably focuses so broadly on the generalist side of things yes. that that you'll when it looks at people living with dementia or, or elder it'll look more hmm. broadly in the elderly care and probably doesn't get into the fundamentals of of what causes the diseases in the first place and so deciding where to target education at what career stage Absolutely. or at what point somebody's decided to specialize I suppose is the tricky bit of that yeah it is it is quite tricky and uh, i think one of the recommendation from my study is to 
include a lot of virtual simulations, lots of role, role plays, case studies. And uh, I, I think when I was looking at the curriculum, uh, the nursing curriculum, they just had one kind of you know module on dementia. It wasn't even called dementia module. It was the long-term conditions module and dementia is just one part of it. So you can imagine in the three years program, they just had this one part about people with de dementia. So my recommendation was to introduce something like a spiral curriculum where they start you know, knowing about dementia in the first year, they kind of go through a little bit more about depths of dementia in second year and third year, uh, they will be able to kind of confidently, you know, look after people with dementia. So I have recommended to introduce spiral curriculum. So l let's see. I mean, I've had I mean, few health... feedbacks. <laughs> Hopefully they will change it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because Health Education England have those tiered dementia training modules, don't they, that all staff have to do and then all NHS have to do that kind of yes. basic introduction and then gradually increase if you're working, you know, if you're a old age psychiatrist, you do more of that. Um, I, I've got a funny feeling that Jay Ashri would be the perfect person to help mm. you um, with develop that module if you wanted to, because that's... Uh, a key component of the GBHI program, which we've talked about on the podcast recently, and that I imagine you've recently had to go through. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I, I think the whole focus on training is something that's, um, that we're really looking at um, quite a bit, and that's actually something that I've got a poster on as well, so I can talk about that a bit later. Great. Well, why don't you tell us about that? Okay, so, uh, so one of the posters that I have is on a caregiver enablement training um, that we've developed for... Um, caregivers in India to provide, to basically kind of upskill them and help them understand how to provide home-based care. And we've kind of piloted this now with 10 um, families to see how this training program, how does it impact their um, daily lives? How does it reduce their caregiver burden? And it was quite interesting because all, all these families showed a reduction in um, caregiver, experienced caregiver burden with the training that we provide them. Um, and it, they the qualitative data showed that they felt that they were able to provide better care because we, they were given more information about dementia, they were given more tailored information about how to deal with um, challenging behaviours, how to manage things like um, issues around bathing, feeding, you know, toileting, things that are often not addressed in a clinic when you just, you know, meet a, a physician, you know, they have a diagnosis, that they're given medication, there isn't really that time that they spend with a professional to understand how to provide care at home and home care is the pre prevalent model of dementia care in India and many low and middle income countries so um, that's something the training aspect of it is again something that I'm really really interested in. That's brilliant and, and you can see how that's got so much potential as well to be adapted I mean and I, I mean we you'd think that the UK would be better at this but I don't really think it is I, I think that that's exactly the kind of program that would be so useful to so many carers even even here as well as in lower middle income countries how did you how did you deliver the training was this was this electronically delivered or was it physical so we kind of had different models and we tried with uh, some, 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 for some of the patient, the specialists went home and delivered the modules, some were hybrid. So some of the, uh, the there was an initial assessment done at the home and then the specialist connected online. Uh, so we're trying to see what might, what works better and compare that because my, my sense is that if we use technology and deliver things in a hybrid model, um, it might provide people with access. It yeah. also saves on a lot uh, of logistic issues and challenges. I can completely see that. In fact, I've, one of my highlights that I'm going to talk about is a poster by Dr. Eda Suarez Gonzalez that talks about an electronic training module for people with um, PCA to, to help them understand about adaptations they can make to lifestyle to help them cope. Um, and one, in fact, I may as well just do this now. And one of the issues there is 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 compliance with completing it. And I think that any any we've done podcasts on this before, particularly with any kind of digital intervention, compliance always seems to struggle. I mean, even with the best patient or public involvement or co-design to make something really easy and usable, compliance with um, using it. Uh, in the way that you intend is always a struggle. But that sounds like a brilliant program. I can't. I'd love for you to come back and talk about that some more as things progress. Um, we recorded a podcast yesterday, uh, which will be coming out in September about 
the work in Norwich about hydration and the importance of drinking and how this uh, how strategies that people have developed to help ensure that uh, that people uh, resident in care homes continue to take on board fluids and what counts and what doesn't count and how to do it. It's, it you can see how things like that would find them way these are just things that carers that wouldn't know that stronger flavored things might help you to continue to drink as you get older and no you shouldn't use sippy cups because it, they might not create spills but they do have <laughs> all kinds of other problems it's fascinating um thank you very much for sharing that so where um what do you remember your poster numbers do you remember to check that out? Or just go look for Jayashri Dasgupta on the platform. Samita looks like you might remember. You're waving. Go on. 75810. <laughs> 75810. Jash? Sarah, do you remember yours? No. Not that prepared. No. Jayashri, no. Okay. Sorry. Just go look. Go look for them. They're, they sound really fascinating. Right. Well, let's move on to the highlights. So as you've all got to talk about your research, I'm going to pick up on the first highlight of something that I've seen today. And this was uh, something that justified a press release. And this was news that new opioid use in older adults with dementia is associated with significant risk of death, including an 11 fold increase in the first two weeks. Uh, this was a study that was done in Denmark. The researchers followed study participants for 180 days after their first opioid prescription. They followed a group of older adults with dementia who did not receive an opioid prescription and compared the risk of death between the two groups. 10,474 or 33% of study participants died within 180 days after initiating their first opioid prescription compared to 3,980, which is only 6.4% of those who didn't have the opioid prescription, which is I mean, that's a huge difference. Um, after adjusting for potential differences between the groups, the researchers found that it was an 11-fold increase on mortality risk for those that were given an opioid prescription. Um, this, the greatest risk came in the first 14 days where mortality of opioids was increased 11-fold. Uh, among those who used fentanyl patches, as their first prescription, 64% died within the first 180 days compared to 6.4% in the unexposed. This was uh, Christina uh, jensen um from Neurology Department at Dementia Research Centre in Copenhagen University. That is surprising. I, I don't get a sense. I'm not quite sure how how uh, whether there were other factors that came into this because, of course, you might not only be prescribed opioids for various purposes, not just because you have dementia, but when you combine dementia with this, whether those other comorbidities came in to increase that factor. Do you get a sense, Sarah, I, I'm guessing you're probably closer to the UK system, having spent times in memory clinics and things. Uh, how, how used are opioids in the UK in that population? I have no idea, actually. I thought I saw the tweeted about this and I thought it was such an interesting um, finding that I really want to learn more about. I know that we had obviously um, spent a lot of time in the UK looking at kind of the psychotropic medications in dementia patients, but opioids, I have absolutely no idea how commonly they use. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's been a lot of focus on reducing antipsychotics, hasn't there? But I, yeah. I think what this clearly suggests is, is that there's a need to look at that particular um, yeah. prescribing practice. Uh, we need to get somebody on the show maybe to talk about that. Uh, well, that's my first highlight. Uh, so go look at that. That's online today. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to stick with you. Why don't you give us your first highlight from the conference? Yeah, so um, my first highlight is I'm going to recommend everyone listening to this who did not see it um, to check out one of the plenaries today. So it was Professor Adesola Ogunia, um, who's at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. And he gave this amazing whistle-stop tour of the epidemiology of dementia in Africa. And I don't know how he packed so much information into a half an hour talk. Um, so he covered kind of what is known so far about dementia epidemiology in Africa, what some of the key problems to tackle are, and really nice kind of looking to the future, what's that looking like? Um, so some of the really interesting things that stood out is kind of how wide the variation in what the prevalence might be is between different studies. So it varied from about 2% to over 40%, depending on studies. 
And some of that, you know, it's kind of different countries reporting different prevalence rates. But also he really highlighted the importance of how dementia is being measured. So there was a um, study which reported from the same country, but two very different uh, measurements of dementia have been used. So two different ways to kind of categorize it. Um, one, one was from the 1066, and that seemed to have kind of a more accurate um, prevalence of dementia, and I can't remember what the other one was. Um, so actually, these studies are kind of applying lots of different methodologies, so it's quite hard to get a grasp on what the prevalence actually is in a lot of African countries. Um, but kind of from what is known, Alzheimer's disease is certainly the most common, but vascular disease accounts for quite a lot more than we might expect um, kind of in Western countries. And in a lot of the risk studies that have been done, age is kind of far and away the biggest risk factor that's both studied and also driving disease. With ApoE4, really interestingly, either not being studied or not contributing anywhere near as much. So there was kind of a study that looked at the Yoruba population. And actually, there wasn't any additional risk for being a heterozygote. There was for being a homozygote, but it was quite small particularly compared to kind of Tunisian populations or African-American populations in the US and definitely lower than Caucasian. So it really highlighted kind of what is known, but also the huge gaps in the knowledge base. He spoke a lot about kind of stigma and then he just spoke a lot about lots of the really large in initiatives that are now underway. So kind of funding that is actually now in place for studies to happen in Africa with African leaders that I think is going to make it really exciting to see what results are coming out over the next few years. I think that acceptance that um, that dementia prevalence is growing in that sub-Saharan African population mm -hmm. is is finally bringing funding to that part of the world, isn't it? And yeah. you can understand that there's an in <laughs> an issue in measuring prevalence. When I remember seeing an EDI talk from last year, where there are some African countries that don't even acknowledge that dementia is a disease or that mm -hmm. Alzheimer's exists. Of course, the clinicians in the hospitals will know it, but if they're not actually, you know, if that public health message isn't going out nobody's going to come then <laughs> what a difficult that sounds fascinating thank you sarah did anybody else see that anybody else got any comments on that particular talk carry on speed yeah yeah so i watched that as well and i agree with sarah i think it's really fascinating to see how things are changing there was another talk uh, i think uh, it was by again i think end of life care in rural and urban settings where uh, there was a research about, again, same thing, how change, how the definition of rural versus urban in Africa is so different than different countries. So, and I think uh, the presenter showed a map where, you know, how, how, you know, different parts of Africa, they've got uh, really huge populations of people with dementia. So there, there, there are things happening, but I think they still need a lot of support in terms of resources and awareness. Yeah. So this session overall was called Dementia Care in Lower Middle Income Countries, I think. Is yes, that the one? Think, yeah. With Adelina Comas Herrera chaired that mm -hmm. session. Um, brilliant. Jayashri, I think you were going to add to it as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that I was, I, I unfortunately, I didn't see this particular session. I mean, there's, there's so much going on. I think I missed this one. So I'm definitely going to catch up on that later. But there were parallels to what you were talking about with another session that I thought were really interesting. Um, and that was actually a session on, um, it was a perspective session um, on opportunities and challenges to promote equity in dementia diagnosis and care in the current landscape of advanced but less accessible diagnostic tools and treatment options. And um, Dr. Lorena Nachi um, spoke about some of the work that other GBHI colleagues have been doing um, in, in Africa and raised some of the ethical issues um, around you know, risk risk assessment and how you communicate this. So I thought that was quite interesting, you know, touched upon the, the whole importance of understanding health literacy and what that means in terms of the kind of research that we, we conduct in these areas. So I just wanted to make that as a comment, which I thought was quite related to what you were talking about as well. well that's one of the great things about the AIC is, is it really is that global community, isn't it? Where you do get to see talks um, from researchers in parts of the world where you wouldn't see them at, at any at anything else. Um, so it's great that, that this conference covers those things. Um, Samita, why don't you tell us about one of your highlights? 
Okay, so uh, I I think that there are a couple of highlights, but I'll possibly talk about this one, which was really fascinating for me. Uh, it's about using humanoid mobile robots and variable sensors to improve quality of life and address worker shortage. So there was this study done by Dr. Arshia Khan, and uh, she's a professor and director at University of Minnesota. And it was very interesting uh, because they also showed some of the videos, how robots were doing different kind of group and individual therapy sessions with people with dementia in care homes. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what those robots are. So these are kind of very uh, dedicated autonomous robots and they are fed with different programs. So they mainly talk about four doma domains. So emotional aspects, physical aspects, cognitive aspects, and uh, social aspects. So each, each robot is kind of fed with that particular program. So they would be offering different types of therapies to people. So in terms of group therapy or one-to-one -one therapy. And uh, it's, they did a study with 16 robots across eight nursing homes. And then they collected data from those nursing homes. And uh, one of the really key thing that they got from nursing home residents that they really liked robots, although there was this not like human connection, but they liked it because they felt that these robots are not going to judge them. I find that really interesting what they said. So these robots are not going to judge them and they're not going to tell them, okay, do this, do that. So this is a very learning point for me because I do a lot of training for carers and families and you know formal carers. And I feel like this is coming really very promptly. And Dr. Khan was explaining that elaborately that how people with dementia kind of take human carers in that kind of you know perspective and that's why they like these robots um, so in terms of cognitive domain they said the robots actually do reminiscence therapy and they showed a video about robots doing that which was very interesting uh, physically i felt it was quite straightforward because i think personally i feel being an occupational therapist putting a program of physical therapy into robot is not very difficult. So the robot was teaching, okay, do different exercises and different things. So that worked out really well. The other interesting aspect... I, I, need, to st I need to stop you there and ask, yeah. I've got questions before, yeah, sure. before you carry on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so wait a second, did they show you a picture? So, because uh, when a you video. say robot, of course, I've got a robot <laughs> vacuum cleaner, which is like, a you know, wanders yeah. around the house cleaning up after me. Uh, uh, is this a, a humanoid shaped yes. robot with arms, legs, yeah. face, the whole yes. thing? And it, and it it actually moves. I'm I'm doing this for people yeah. watching on YouTube. If you're not watching on YouTube, you should go watch. <laughs> We've got because everybody's faces you get to see. Um, so it actually moves its its arms and legs. Yes, it does. To of deliver course, this, it, does it, it doesn't look like does, a robot. Does it strut up and down? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. the robot and does was... it like walk up and down? Yeah. And it, the one of the robo actually sitting on a table and doing all showing all the exercises. Yeah. And what I really oh found goodness. fascinating, I mean, I, I mean, this is the next level suggestion from me, really, to make those robots a bit more like, you know, giving them more human features, because they still look like robo, you know, the white head, white arms, white legs. So why not kind of modify them and give them like... I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I, I disagree with this. I think this is fundamentally <laughs> wrong. I, I, I just... This 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 is straight out of an Isaac Asimov book where you replace a human <laughs> with a robot because you just don't have enough people or you can't be bothered to... This is, this is a job for a person. This yeah, is not a job I, for a robot. I mean, fine, if you can... I, I, I don't care. You, I, you I agree with, with you, me. Adam, I mean... and I, I'm coming to that point. Uh, so that's going to be my critical analysis of the, you know, of that I study. I mean, it's maybe great if if you're in a, I don't know. I mean, there, I can see that there could be a use case for this in rural Africa where you can't send a person. But then again, are you going to send a, a robot then? No, of course you're not. <laughs> This, this is I in the US. I can't see a place, a place and time where you would really need this. I mean, this is... I mean, why? If you're really that desperate, surely this just goes back to the days when, you, if you're in a nursing home, you'd wheel out the big telly with the video attached to it and just put a cassette in the recorder and play the cassette for people. What are they getting from this robot that you couldn't get from putting a DVD in a player? 
I mean, because I'm assuming it can't. It doesn't have. I yes, I, it does. I would in say. In which case, this is really scary. Does it have Chat GPT AI <laughs> in it, where it can actually answer questions? Then oh. that it gets from the internet the answers. Okay, I'll come to that point. So the next domain is about social and emotional interaction. So where robot was telling jokes, and uh, it, it the jokes were <laughs> ki- kind of very lame jokes, nothing very specific. But robot was asking things. Do you want me to tell another joke? And you know he that robot would follow some instructions. So definitely the program must be fed accordingly. I'm sure there must be some limitations. But what I found from this presentation, the limitations were not discussed. So for me, that's my critical analysis for this particular presentation. That I would like to know what are the kind of limitations, and whether this is I I know possibly they did it in just one place and if we have to adopt that kind of you know program then we definitely need to do a little bit more digging around uh, ethics I'm, and different I'm, things i'm a big fan <laughs> of artificial intelligence and new technologies and things like that but i can also see how this has potentially got kind of some real risk factors i mean fine you're still going to need a person there to supervise because if one of your people in the audience one of your trainees starts doing something and struggles or gets out of breath or isn't quite doing it right in a way that could injure themselves you've got this potential that they might hurt themselves and it's because a person would have been able to identify and also as well a person would be able to don't we talk about in dementia so much about this person-centered Thank care you. and the idea that training and occupational and therapy thing should also be person-centered <laughs> you can't just chuck a bunch of people in a room and say i mean fine this isn't to say a robot can only teach a group of people that it couldn't do somebody one-on-one i don't know yeah that's it that's I'm interesting talking myself uh, out of this now i yeah, can so see I... having a robot <laughs> that's dedicated to that to wander around a nursing home with a hundred residents doing one-to-one sessions is something that will be quite hard to perhaps employ a person but i'm still well in in the video i could see there are people around robots so i'm i was assuming maybe they are the kind of coordinators or the carers who are supervising robot and who are supervising the group of people but in that case why yeah. not just get the person to do it right <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> Uh, I've got a feeling my, my response to this might be controversial. Sorry, anybody. I'm, I'm sure it's a wonderful study. and I, I, It sounds really interesting. Um, I'd love to see how that, what the plans are for potentially rolling that out on scale. Jayashri, I'm going to come to you next to pick up on yours. Come on, give me something I can say I dislike. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I, I don't know, but I think this, this, the highlight session that I was going to talk about was really the perspective session on lacanumab and the appropriate use recommendations. Let's do um, it. So, yeah, <laughs> I think that's a fairly safe zone there. Let's get um, into lacanumab. It's going to come up all week, I, I think, in every show now. Uh, let's, let's do it. Go for it. And I th- uh, Well, I thought this, the entire session was really interesting because of the way that it was um, it, it was such a lot of discussion about, um, you, you know, how do you, you know, really taking it from these clinical trials into how do we actually prescribe this and what are the recommendations and the guidelines. And I thought the whole discussion around the, you know, the risk factors and what should we do um, going forwards, what do we need to think about was really what stood out as a highlight for me. Um, in particular, I, I really enjoyed um, Dr. Jill uh, Rubino Vici's um, presentation, um, and he was talking about how we have to look at the, um, you know, what is it that we really need to build if we're going to start, um, you know, using these sort of treatments. And he and he highlighted something I wasn't really aware of that that you know because uh, lecanemab, I, I think these kind of interventions are have a, you know a while to come into low and middle income contexts definitely so i was looking at it from that perspective of really trying to understand where they are in high income countries and contexts but he mentioned that um you know the apoe testing is not a routine part of clinical assessment and he highlighted how important that is actually when you're prescribing and that that's something which i wasn't really aware of um, prior to this um and he, and he also raised another interesting issue around um you know the resources for genetic counseling and you know who does this um you know what do you tell people what do you tell families and as an ethics researcher i i just thought this was really interesting and fascinating because obviously when you do this testing there are implications for the other family members as well so what information do you 
provide and share to whom you know where are the gu where's the guidance on that who does this if, if you take these kind of interventions to scale um who you know wh where are the guidelines for that and um, you know do we have research that's looking at these kind of areas so i thought i just thought that was really um fascinating and i also thought there was another thing that um, he showed which i thought was really interesting and that was like a visual aid to facilitate risk communication to um, to families, and I just thought that was really interesting because it, it's it's important to think about how you convey the scientific information to families when you sit down and have a discussion about do you want to take this treatment up, um, and it was I thought that that was really interesting. So uh, that was really a highlight for me. I completely agree, and that actually ties in nicely with the I watched the ESI sponsored symposium, which is at the very end of the day that. Um, I can't. I, I didn't catch his surname, but there was a, a, a person called Alessandro who was from Italy, and Craig Ritchie gave a talk on that as well. And they were talking about the about the addressing. So there was no research presented in this as such. It was more opinions about addressing the challenges in this new Alzheimer's disease space, where we might have disease modifying therapies, and then there's this push for early diagnosis, but. And what were the barriers to early diagnosis, which I thought was particularly interesting because it, in all likelihood, we know that the, even with lecanemab and, and the drugs we have now, that the earlier you give them, the better. In fact, probably before symptoms even manifest themselves. But how are you going to, how are you practically going to do that? And how do you define the, uh, the disease and decide then who to give that to? And then they went on to talk a little bit about some of the, emerging solutions um they saw they they he really nicely broke the barriers down into these kind of four areas there was patient related barriers which he picked up on there thinking that symptoms were a normal part of aging so which is of course why we know people don't go to the doctors in the first place that they might hide the symptoms and not disclose them to other people or compensate in other ways or that there was stigma and fear attached to it which is another reason why people don't go to the doctors they picked up on resource barriers so even though we know we now have a reliably proven set of uh, blood-based biomarker testing that they're not used so the need for a definitive agree which biomarkers you're going to use which nobody can agree on uh, there isn't agreement on that right now anyway um, access to PET and MRI of course which isn't a routine part of diagnosis uh, in normal clinical practice not consistently anyway certainly not in our country in the UK um, and then limited treatment options they also talked about setting um, physician barriers so uh, physicians really struggling I know I've talked to my boss who who's written a piece recently that talks about it's just really difficult to diagnose somebody now particularly if you encourage younger younger people to come in at the first sign of symptoms and you just you can understand why my mild cognitive impairment is used even though I know lots of people don't like it it's because the truth is, is you just don't know. Um, it's too early to tell whether what somebody has uh, is due to normal aging or something else or is actually Alzheimer's. Um, and of course, if you haven't got access to those other biomarkers at the moment, it or even if you did, just because amyloid's there doesn't necessarily mean it's, yeah. Um, so it, it, anyway, this was a really interesting talk. They talked about the barriers. They talked about availability of MRI and then some of the strategies and the key strategies that they were picking up on is uh, increased awareness amongst people and particularly healthcare professionals, um, which kind of talks to what you were saying earlier, Samita, about, you know, and this isn't just psychiatrists and neurologists being aware, it's GPs, it's practice nurses, it's everybody who, dentists and opticians, anybody who might be in that space. Um, adoption of biomarker testing, definitely. And it's great, we've talked about this earlier this week, because the UK has got this big fund uh, grant call open at the moment that to test exactly that, which which biomarkers should we use and how do you practically implement them in the healthcare system and then they talked about um, design and ideal processes to detect so again looking at algorithms that can bring in all those other different factors to try and spot those early symptoms but putting them into use so it was a really interesting session um, but thank you Josh was there any final thoughts from that one did they did were there any big takeaways I think there were 
were really trying to highlight the the fact, you know, looking at the the risks um, and the recommendations, but also talking about the benefits that this would have, because there was a lot of focus which was on the the risks um, initially, and they, they they would, I mean, I think the takeaway was that we need more data, we need more research, um, and right now that it's these are recommendations with caution, um, because we don't have the data and the research, so we just need to to wait. So it's great. So that sounds like a really interesting session to go look at. And, and the one I mentioned was from ESI, which is at the end of the day. Do you remember the name of that one? I think it was a perspective session, Lacanamab, Appropriate Use and Recommendations. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to, uh, I think we've only got time now for one more round because I've prattled on for too long. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you. So I'm going to highlight a poster because I always love the posters at AIC. Um, so this was an author, the lead author is Juliana Tavares. Um, so, so she's from the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. And the poster was looking at the Eat Lancet diet. So that's a diet that has come out relatively recently um, from the Lancet group, which is a diet that is aimed to both be beneficial for health, but also good for kind of planetary health as well. So I think it's a really interesting diet to get more data on. So this particular poster was looking at associations with cognitive function, brain structures, and ecological sustainability in the German cohort. Awesome. They had quite, oh, yeah, it was really cool. They had quite a wide age range of 30 to 95, but they mean age was like 56, so midlife population. And it was a really large cohort, over 7,000 with cognitive data and 5,000 with MRI data. Um, so they looked at kind of how well their cohort was eating to the recommended intakes that Eat Lancet gives for 14 food groups and vegetables looked like they were quite a lot below and red meat and sweeteners were above but generally all the others looked like they were kind of hitting the recommended range which I think in and of itself is relatively impressive having looked at different diet schools. Um, they found that the higher Eat Lancet schools or kind of more adherence to the Eat Lancet recommendations were associated with better cognitive function globally um, and executive function, verbal memory and total memory, but they didn't see anything with brain volumetric measures. And then interestingly, they did, as probably would be expected, saw this association between higher Eat Lancet diet schools, lower greenhouse gas emissions and lower land use. So it's clearly doing something for cognitive health and clear environmental benefits, but probably still not sure kind of what the actual mechanisms of this are because there was no association at this time point, at least in this kind of midlife population with the brain volumetric measures. No, and clearly it's a bit of a stretch to connect those two, but I love that they made the effort, right? To, to, to look at that from an environmental perspective. That's mm -hmm. great. And yeah. so was, so was, sorry, did you say that that was, that was just focused in a single country. It didn't, it wasn't, in other countries or globally or yeah so it's just in it's in the rhineland study which i think is just in germany great i'd, I'd love to see that that spread out that sounds really interesting because mm -hmm. you know there's so many all those there's so many diet studies aren't there that picking up on which ones are valuable i think is interesting thank you sarah samita i'm going to come back to you okay so i'm also going to talk about a poster so this is particularly got my attention and this is something because I'm starting my PhD, I'm quite keen to know in terms of ethical considerations. So this is about uh, ethical considerations for action research involving groups with potential cognitive impairment. And this is uh, this possibly was a project between different countries. So I've seen some universities from Australia and then UK. And this is presented by Daniel Kelly. Uh, what I really liked, I mean, to start with, the topic is interesting, but the way poster uh, it's presented, it's really nice. It's like chicken and egg. So you will see chicken, egg, chicken, egg. So where do you start and where do you end? Because it's like chicken and egg <laughs> uh, story. So what what they are trying to say here is it's really important for people with the cognitive impairment to have a voice and to contribute to any research project. And this is something I think you might have heard already, Adam, about this. But I've, I keep hearing about, you know, whether we really need ethics approvals. We have a really long process. We have several forms to fill up. And when you're involving people with uh, dementia and different cognitive impairments, it's really hard for them to fill up all these forms and follow these processes. 
And that's one of the reasons people really don't want to participate in most of the research project. And this is a kind of ongoing battle. Where do we start and how do we do this? So this poster I really liked for that reason, because it's kind of, you know, uh, raising that discussion again. And what they're saying is we need that research paradigm shift in terms of how do we involve these people into research projects, because this is about them. But if we can't involve them, we, if we keep following all these different processes, uh, it's really going to be hard to get their voice uh, in the research project. So one of the suggestion is to how, how do we collaborate? How do we think creatively? I think ethics panels do an amazing job. I mean, the, the, the variety of work that they're asked to look at and give opinions on Jayashree as an ethicist. I'm sure you're going to have an opinion on this. But also as well, I think, I think sometimes trying to protect people can get in the way of even, you know, of what the people actually they're trying to protect want. And I think having more experts with lived experience involved in ethics panel is great for ethics panels to say you've got to have patient and public involvement, which they mostly I'd say do now. But I think equally, you could have some patient and public involvement in the ethics panels of people with lived experience who are in a much better place to judge whether a study is practically deliverable or not. Um, if you're on an ethics panel and you've got a way of doing that, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear more about that. But I, I think it's something that could be looked at. Jay Ashri, uh, do you have a view on that? You know, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think it is a. It's a really. Um, it, it, it's a difficult kind of situation to see. You know, some of these things are so difficult to implement, but they're, they're safeguards that are required as well. So, I mean, I'd love to know if someone has, you know anything to add to this uh, further. I think it's, you know, another another thing that we've experienced, at least in working in um, an LMIC context, is, you know, the whole process of participating in research itself is so um, new for people that, you know, even when they don't have dementia, even if you're working with the normal population, it's, you know, when you're talking about the whole process of gathering ethics, that's, that, you know, and participating in research, it, it's, it's very novel. So, um, that's that's again something which I'm very interested in looking at. I haven't yet done that, but it's it's you know so there's a, I think there's a lot of scope for work that can um, help ethics committees streamline these processes, um, keeping in mind the voices of people with um, various illnesses as well as the different contexts in which these research studies have to be conducted. I agree, Sarah. You've brushed up a few against a few ethics panels in your time. Uh, I also have the pleasure of sitting on two. And do you know what? I, I thought you did. I just, I thought you did. I just, I didn't want to pick on you just in case. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the vice chair of an NHS ethics committee, but I'm also a member of the Samaritans ethics committee. Um, and on the Samaritans ethics committee, they do have lived experience representatives sat on it. And it's amazing. And I think it makes it much better. But I guess the ease that they have is that they look within a specific uh, kind of research area, so it's possible to recruit for, whereas the NHS Ethics Committee, so this is obviously for UK, we have like lay members, and obviously the expert members could also have their own health conditions that they are a PPI member for as they come in. But actually, like you said, every, you see so many things, it'd be impossible to have PPI for everyone, but it is something that I think about with quite a lot of applications when I think we just don't understand the experience of these participants to know if that PPI that's been done by this research group is good enough. And I think, yeah, there could definitely be a way to do it better. I think having a pool, maybe having like a pool of people that you could draw yeah. upon to say, can we, can we draw you in to look at that? Thank you very much, Samita. That's fascinating. Um, Jashri, have you got another... You had another poster, I think, you were going to talk about. No, I was actually just going to talk about the, the plenary. That was something... Oh, yeah, of course. That, that, I mean, I just thought that was really fascinating. Um, uh, Professor Marcel Solem's um, plenary on the, the aphasic dementia of Alzheimer's disease. And I think one thing that he... I, I, I was really interested in the data that he was presenting. Um, and one of the things that really stood out for me was he made statements mentioning that, you, you know... Um, that they're now kind of trying to, to show the evidence that um, only language related um, issues could be a biomarker for um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I think of what that would mean for 
um, you know, scalable assessment. And he actually he said that, you, you know, that would be really scalable kind of biomarker assessment, you know. Um, which I, I, th I think that that just, just, it was just really fascinating to hear that from him and, and think potential future, because particularly when you're looking at low and middle income contexts, um, language assessment seems to be something that might be potentially scalable. Um, and if there is an evidence base to show that there is a pathway to do that, then I'd be very interested to see where that research goes. That does sound interesting. Um, so go have a look at the planning. Rate. I, do you know what I had that? So we had a, many, many years ago, we had somebody on the podcast come and talk about how they'd used Amazon Echo devices uh, as a home help tool fundamentally. But that did get me to think at the time that I wonder if an Echo, a home Echo could be programmed to analyze your vocal interactions to spot stress, you know, so it could say, hey, you sound a bit stressed. We, I know you see this on, on, you know, Blade Runner, the computer would probably do, be able to do this. But it sounds like, it feels like between AI and the devices we have in our homes, that things like that can't be too far away where they could potentially identify changes in the language that you've used or something, maybe every Monday morning it'd ask you to to read something out or tell it a story and then over time it could say i could see that being practical of course not everybody in low middle countries is going to have a, a a smart device in their home but I, I, it sounds brilliant thank you so much do you know what i think we really i know you've all got at least one more highlight to say but as ever we really have run over on time i had one on hearing loss um I'm going to read this really quickly, then we're not going to talk about it. Hearing loss in dementia and older adults. Uh, previous studies have suggested that hearing loss may contribute to cognitive decline, but there hasn't been any randomized controlled trials to measure the impact or effectiveness of hearing aids in reducing the risk. This um, Achieve study, launched in 2017, followed a thousand adults from age 70 to 84 and found that there was no significant difference in cognitive decline between participants who used hearing aids and those who didn't overall. However, in the group at higher risk of dementia, those who wore hearing, hearing aids had a 48% chance less <laughs> chance of cognitive decline after three years compared to those who didn't. Um, I, I didn't get, I didn't see the detail as to what they defined as higher dementia risk group. I don't think they really got into APOE, maybe they did, but um, they identified this higher risk group and if they used hearing aids they were beneficial but they weren't overall. The study highlights the importance of hearing aids for individuals at risk of experiencing dementia and, and suggests that hearing loss may have a positive impact on cognitive health which I think, as we said, we knew, but this is a trial kind of to some extent proving what everybody thought was the case already. I think that's all we've got time for today. I'd usually ask you what you're looking forward to tomorrow, but we really, really have overrun. <laughs> uh, was there anything else that anybody really must get into the show? I'm looking forward to one particular one, which is about hormones and dementia. So how, you know, hormones are really contributing to memory impairment and that's something i'm really keen uh, because at our university we've recently kind of launched menopause support group and different things so i think we talked about menopause earlier on in the week as well and i've certainly seen a couple of posters looking at um the impact of menopause on cognitive decline um this has been brilliant thank you ever so much as ever really super fascinating to have everybody's views and great that you've all been so many different sessions um of course the platform is going to be available for at least another month i think after the conference so if you're there uh, in person uh, you can go away and hopefully catch up on some of these sessions later or if you're watching online go and have a look um thank you very much again everybody uh today i've been joined by the brilliant Dr. Jayashri Dasgupta, Samita Kure, and Sarah Gregory, soon to be Dr. Sarah Gregory from uh, Edinburgh. It's been brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Thank you so much, Adam, Thanks for so much. having us. Thank you. You'll find profiles on all of my brilliant guests and information on the conference um, and far more information if you use Twitter. Just search hashtag 
AIC 23 for those that aren't attending you'll see that there are lots of photographs of posters and summaries of sessions so go have a look on Twitter and do check out our website to read up more about our brilliant guests. I'll be back tomorrow with three more guests for our final show in this week's AIC highlights so Stick with me one more day, I promise, and then and then we'll have a two-week break before you get any more podcasts. I'm, I'm very conscious we've swamped you recently. Uh, I'm Adam Smith, and you've been listening to the Dementia Researcher Podcast. The Dementia Researcher Podcast was brought to you by University College London with generous funding from the UK National Institute for Health Research, Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Association, and Race Against Dementia. Please subscribe, leave us a review and register on our website for full access to all our great resources. DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk